Well, thank you so much, Gail. Thank you so much, and thank you all of you for being here. I want to say Gail is very persistent. Uh, when she asked me to do this last September, I immediately said yes, and I was there. And then several weeks went by, and then months went by, and she had kept reaching out and uh, was very persistent on getting me here. So thank you so much for having me here. And um, I want to thank all of you for being here. These discussions are never easy, especially for those of you that may be new to the climate change space or new to climate change discussions. So A, thank you for being here. B, thank you for being open and, and wanting to share this dialogue with me because I think that is how ultimately we come upon uh, better solutions for uh, not only our communities and our towns, but also our state, local, federal government as well, and us as a country and ultimately us as a globe. Uh, so there's my bio, as uh, Gail just mentioned. I have a degree in meteorology from Florida State University with a minor in mathematics. I've got a degree in broadcast journalism from the University of Arkansas. Um, and then I have my certified broadcast meteorologist seal of approval from the American Meteorological Society and I'm on a couple of boards and cabinets with uh, the AMS as it's called. And I, the reason I point that out is because the AMS is the largest or second largest, largest organization in the U.S. Uh, of meteorologists. So it's considered a governing body for what uh, the future of the weather, water and climate enterprise may look like. However, even in this day of 2024, the membership in the AMS only sits at about two to maybe at best in a good year, 4% uh, people of color. And I think that's very important because we don't have a lot of people of color, not only in the room to make those decisions, but you also don't get that voice. And I see a lot of women here today. The membership of women in the AMS is also on the order of like 23 to 24%. So still not as large as it should be for the discussions that women would like to have as it's pertaining to the weather, water, and climate enterprise. So I see a couple of young girls in the room, young women. If you want to be a meteorologist, please reach out. I would love to help you become a meteorologist and get your uh, AMS seal of approval from the American Meteor Meteorological Society. Um, and a lot of these solutions, and we'll talk about that at the end of this presentation, but a lot of these solutions aren't actually geared toward people of color or women or future mothers just because the discussion has not often been had centered around those uh, traditionally underrepresented groups. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and every meteorologist needs a radar. <laughs> and uh, this is my almost four month old dog radar who has lots of energy. His tail wags around like a weather radar. I'm not kidding. Um, but I named him radar because it was a cool name and why not have a dog named radar as a meteorologist. So I, I want to hear from you uh, as much as you want to hear from me. Uh, what, does anyone know the difference in weather and climate? And feel free to shout out the answer or raise your hand. I just need one volunteer or two. It's okay to be wrong. Short term versus long term. Short term versus long term. What's your name? Erica. Erica. Erica? Thank you, Erica. Short term versus long term. So short term, obviously weather, and then long term would be climate. So Erica is exactly correct. Weather is what we expect. Uh, weather is what we get in the short term today, tomorrow, next week. And climate is what we expect in the long term, oftentimes considered a 20 year average, a 30 year average, a 60 year average, a decades long average, a thousand year average and 800,000 year average, all of those things and deviations uh, get us the definition of climate. So let's practice. Climate, we expect it to be cold in mid-January mid where traditionally our average high temperature is 36 degrees on January the 13th. Can anyone just take a guess as to what this January the 13th looks like? 45, 49, 40, what about 60? That was the 60 degree day in January. We just had one uh, a couple of weeks ago as well in February. I could go through the day to day weather sort of nomenclature, but that wouldn't really get us to climate. However, to say that those deviations are happening more and more frequently from getting away from climate. Uh, 
someone on social media, I love social meteorologists is what I call them because they love to be social meteorologists. Someone says, well, Tevin, this is weather, not climate change. And while that may be true, there are connections to weather and climate change that we see every single day. Ironically, that was the day that we gave the presentation uh, last September is when that remark came in. This, I just presented this last Thursday or Friday. This is this winter uh, compared to the past 150 winters or so since 1850 or 1852, I believe. Um, and what this shows is our average temperature in Boston specifically, because that's where we have the most data from, compared to average. Our average temperature this year was nearly 37 degrees, which makes 2024 so far, we still have a couple of weeks left, the fourth warmest winter on average. Out of 150 years, fourth warmest. Okay, 2020, 2002, 2016, 2023. The top five warmest winters in southern New England have all come within the past 24 years. And it's very likely, by the way, that even though it's cold today, it was cold yesterday, we're going to have 50s by Saturday and then 50s to 60s next week as we close out February. So that December, January, February span will very likely end up keeping 2024 as the fourth, maybe even third warmest winter on record. Again, 2023 is on that list. 2020 is on that list. So the frequency of where we're starting to see more heat, more warmth is occurring more recently. And it's not just here in New England too. All the blue dots show you where winter is the fastest warming season. All the green dots would show you where spring is the fastest warming season. All the yellow dots are summer and orange dots are fall. So we don't have too many fall warming, uh, warming spells, but winter by far outpaces every other season for the fastest warming. Now let's look at that locally. Since 1970, so again, using that, this would be a 50 year average. Since 1970, winter has become Boston's fastest warming season, outpacing spring, outpacing summer, outpacing fall. And all of those have warmed by an order of two to three to maybe two, to, sorry, uh, one and a half to three degrees since 1970. And while three degrees may seem very minuscule and minor, what happens when your body runs a fever? Three degrees, four degrees, five degrees. You get sick. The earth is getting sick as well. And three degrees is not every single winter, every single day. This is taking an average of those 60 degree days that we're having in January or February and those fewer teens, 20s and 30 degree days that we're not having in December, January and February. Um, this was an image that for some reason did not show up, uh, did not capture well. Uh, wow, this is the first time I'm seeing this. What this did show though was January of 2024, so just last month, I can describe it to you. It would be the entire uh, globe and it has different markations from what climate has done in Janu January of 2024. So this year, just last month, South America had its warmest January on record. Africa had its warmest January on record. The Arctic had its 15th warmest January on record. If we look down towards the south, this would of course be the South Pole. Antarctica had its fifth coldest January on record, so that is good. We like to see more cold, but even the, some of the cold is not outpacing the warm. Uh, to the north, it said the Arctic had its fifth, 15th warmest January, and then the Arctic sea ice extent, Arctic sea ice extent this January ranked 20th lowest on record. And the reason we like to look at the pole specifically is because that's where some of the coldest of the cold air has traditionally been kept across the globe. And so when you start to maneuver around what traditionally was cold, the coldest of the cold at that, when it's no longer cold, that's a very strong signal for what's happening globally. And then of course the polar bears and whatnot, they can't live because it's too warm there. And the, the uh, glaciers start to melt and then the ice in the ocean starts to cause the oceans, uh, the sea levels to rise. That's climate change. I found that not really uh, successful when trying to portray climate change information because how many of us have seen a polar bear? Exactly. 
I would rather tell you what that's going to do to the coastline of New England in the next 20 or 30 years than tell you about a polar bear that, again, none of you have seen. I've been to several zoos. I, too, have never seen a polar bear. Sorry about the polar bears. I can assure you that that is a very integral part of the animal kingdom. But as for this presentation and most climate change presentations, it's not the best form of communication. So climate change is the effect. Our climate has changed because of what we've done to it as a global society, as the United States, as a country, as a continent on North America, and as a globe. And essentially, and I don't want to bore you with the, uh, the schematics here, but what happens as the sun emits heat down towards the earth, we have greenhouse gases in the atmosphere that trap that heat where you and I live and work and play. And because that heat cannot escape, back out to space as it traditionally would, that is, that is then the ultimate global warming. That's when you, when you hear global warming, that's what climate change is. Um, or climate, sorry, global warming is an, underneath an umbrella of climate change, but there are several different factors. While we see more greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, methane, uh, CFCs or chlorofluorocarbons, and then water vapor. And water vapor is interesting because that is a naturally occurring phenomenon in the atmosphere. That would happen no matter what. There would always be water vapor in the atmosphere. It's how we can breathe. It's how this, the water cycle plays out. It's how it rains. It's how it so, uh, snows sometimes. But what we're doing to the water cycle, what we're doing to water vapor is we're adding more into the atmosphere. For every one degree Celsius of warming, there's about four to 7% more water vapor into the atmosphere. So if we have more water vapor in the atmosphere because we've warmed it, now we have the potential to have stronger floods, heavier rainfall events during hurricanes. If you've got family or friends that live across the California West Coast, I'm sure you've seen the weeks of rainfall that they've had. I think the stat this morning was that they've had two months worth of rainfall. Let's see, hold on, sorry. A year's worth of rainfall in the past two months in California. Traditionally, a desert-like climate or a semi-arid climate region is now having rainfall events more significantly, more frequently, and this is not something that has happened just because of climate change, but climate change has been a contributing factor or an accelerant. And I mentioned carbon dioxide being one of the most frequent ga uh, greenhouse gases in our atmosphere, and that does come from the Industrial Revolution since about 1850 to the early 1900s. As we've added more CO2, you can see the spike that's happened. This is 300 parts per million in 1910, and that's 2019. So within the past few years, this is how quickly, well, past century, this is how quickly we've added more CO2 into our atmosphere. And this, and I hate showing this because this really puts it together, I think quite simply, our temperature cycle has also grown with the carbon dioxide emissions. The red line would be the carbon dioxide emissions and then the uh, white line is the temperature cycle. And yes, there are some years where, okay, well we go down, that's great, but our overall downs are not as frequent as our overall ups. This would then be, this was a July of 2023, uh, published in July rather of 2023, showing the Earth's overall surface temperature and how 15.8 degrees Celsius, by the way, and I hate that we talk in Celsius because a lot of us think Fahrenheit, but globally temperatures measured in Celsius. Since about 1950, the average temperature was about 15.8 degrees. And then by 1990, we started to see more and more uh, or darker reds, temperatures that are warmer than the normal, such that by 2023, I think that number is about 35 or what is that, 17, 17.8 17 or something like that. So that ultimately, again, expresses how the earth as a whole has warmed. Not every single year in America will be warmer than the normal. The past couple of months have certainly been warmer than the normal in the country, but not every single year will line up with the globe. But it's important to look at climate change as a global construct, as what's happening on the earth as a whole. And then this also coincides with uh, June, July, and August, what are typically our hottest months of the year globally here. Temperatures back in 1980, were sometimes four degrees or 0.4 degrees cooler than normal uh, in 1985, almost 0.5 degrees cooler than the norm. And now we've had 
more frequent or at higher repetition years where temperatures have now been 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, ultimately up to, upwards to almost an, uh, a degree centigrade above the norm. So our colds here are no longer colder, but the hots are now hotter, if that makes sense. Whoops, did I go past two? Here, this is uh, from the IPCC. It's an intergovernmental panel on climate change. It's a global effort to uh, present climate change information, research, facts, and findings to the overall world. Again, looking at Earth's warming since uh, 1960, 1980, remember that 0.5 degree rate of warming that we saw, upwards till about, uh, this is 2020 now, the year that the world stood still, uh, we were about a degree centigrade above the norm. And then there are different model projections here. The purple line would be if no reduction of uh, non-CO2 radiative forcing is in D. So that would be the lower limits or the lower bound on um, if we were to reduce our carbon emissions. And then the blue line would be the fastest way to reduce our carbon emissions. Uh, and then I believe there should be the current trajectory at red if we were to continue limiting our emissions on where we are right now. So ultimately, even if we were to stop doing everything, we would still be outpacing our 1970, 1980, and 1990 rate of warming as an Earth. And this is from the World Health Organization. Just a quote that I liked. Um, I think it really summarizes how we have to look at this. It is a human threat or a, a threat facing humanity. Climate change is, and it impacts, there's an intersect at every single way of life uh, that a lot of us live. And so we wanna go back to those rates of warming, 1.5 degrees Celsius, two degrees centigrade, three degrees centigrade, and four. And basically what you're looking at here is uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius and two degrees Celsius. Those would be the impacts through about the next uh, 60 to 70 years or so. Um, and we would still see as a, uh, as a earth or as a planet, four months average drought where 62% more burned are in wildfires. We just had wild, uh, wildfires across Canada, high impact pollution days for air pollution across Canada. That air dropped right down south. I think we were looking at May with uh, desert orange like skies. The air pollution was the worst in the world for, I believe it was Chicago or New York City at one point. Um, and so all of these things in the atmosphere are connected. What happens, in, this is not something where you, know, you, you have a house and you build a fence and everything that happens in your house and your lane is only on your property and this is your neighbor's property and this is the fence and that's the dividing line. The earth does not operate that way. The atmosphere does not operate that way. We see the fluidity in the atmosphere. What happens across the west coast pushes across the east coast. These are, these are basic principles of meteorology and how air travels or air can travel. But we also see impacts beneath the surface too, into Earth's oceans. Last year, we saw what happened to, I believe it was the, key, uh, the Keys, rather in South Florida, how coral bleaching, because of sea surface temperatures, killed off coral life one of the most precious forms of life in the ocean, sort of the, 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 the wisdom factor, if you will, to the ocean, has started to decline. By 2100, virtually all coral reef would likely be lost because of chloral, be uh, chloral bleaching and the surface temperatures that would warm. Chloral be bleaching impacts, of course, the coral. You go to, uh, let's see, northern Gulf Coast or Key West or Key Largo or Miami-Dade County and there's coral there and you're thinking, oh, that's cool to see it. But what happens when there's no fish that can live and survive in the coral? coral. Sorry, I hate that tongue twister of a word. If there's no fish that can live and survive there, then some of the other marine life that depend on that fish or those smaller fishes in the animal kingdom to, to live and to sustain, they don't have life in order to live now, so they die off. So we're essentially killing off one species after another species after another species in sort of a chain reaction form. So now this is where all of you come in. Uh, this was uh, the presentation that was geared towards the Massachusetts um, uh, Health and Health and Health. Health Care Association, but also the um, Public Nurse, Nurses Association last September. Um, 
heat. With climate change, we know that heat will become more prominent. It already is the number one weather-related killer on a 30-year average. In the United States, we see an average of about 158 to 160 deaths uh, as a country, and those are the documented cases. There are several cases that don't go documented because medical, medical examiners say that, well, the heat wave wasn't well publicized, so we don't know if someone died of a stroke or maybe the, the heat wasn't as strong, so we can't put that as a contributing factor in a death. I'm not a medical expert. I will never pretend to be a, a medical examiner nor a healthcare expert, but as a meteorologist, I am telling you now that heat will be more prominent. So whatever you have to do to make that more of a priority or more of a question mark on, on uh, death certificates, ultimately that will then, I think, have a full cycle of, oh, well, we saw that this person died from a, from a heat-related death, death or illness or heat stroke in 2023, and they were in this specific neighborhood, and this specific neighborhood was an urban heat island, and they were walking to work, and maybe that triggered something. The heat triggered it. But we have to start answering those questions, and we can't just leave the giant question marks and say, well, it wasn't publicized, so we don't exactly know. Well, I don't know what to tell you other than heat will become more prominent. Um, Sticking with heat, we know that uh, it was a direct contributor to deaths in 1995 during a Chicago heat wave where more than 700 people died. And that was quite interesting because we, going back to 1995, not that that was a lifetime ago for anyone, but that was a well-publicized heat wave. 700 people died. And it's still to this day, uh, we see extreme cases of heat go undocumented. We have to start questioning our local officials. We have to start questioning our state officials and our federal officials as well. Um, I think I am in the firm belief that if we know how someone died or we know why someone died, we can prevent future deaths. Uh, air pollution, this is globally here where 1.2 million deaths each year occur because of air pollution. Some of those are driven by wildfires. Some of those can be driven because of where a specific person or type of person lives. And I'll explain a little bit more about air pollution momentarily. Uh, drought, by the year 2090, climate change may double the frequency of extreme drought events that could be increased in duration sixfold and also increase the land space 10 to 30%. So that's saying they will be more frequently and more larger. If droughts are more frequent, frequent and more larger, they're pretty much not only inevitable, you cannot avoid them. Um, you cannot go, what, 15 miles in the Commonwealth without seeing farmland somewhere. I can assure you that number is far less in a place like Arkansas, where I am from, where right down the road is someone's farm, and on someone's farm there's cattle, there's uh, crops that depend on water. In a, in a drought situation where everyone is uh, thirsty, including the ground, that has an impact not on wildlife, but also on human life as well. When it comes to crops, when it comes to the food that all of us eat, if we can't get eggs because our chickens can't live off of the lack of water, what was it, 2023, where eggs were like, I don't know, $6 a dozen or something like that? Like All of these things, these triggers are going off every single day, and I think we, we gloss over it, but everything ties back to how we have treat, treated this earth. And everything t ties back to what it will look like in the future. I hope we can figure out a way to, to lower the cost of eggs, but you know, if it's $6 in 2023, inflation will tell us at some point it's probably gonna be $8 a dozen. Uh, flooding, sea level rise, and variable precipitation events. That gets directly back to uh, the statement that I made earlier that every degree of warming in the atmosphere presents about four to seven percent more water vapor and more water vapor means you're going to ring out more extreme rainfall events on the higher end of the scale. Also because of climate change we talked about how the north and south poles were um, losing glacier, losing, losing the extent of sea ice. Well once the ice melts it grows in size and that causes a, a rise in the sea level. Here in the Commonwealth, we have 1,500 miles of coastline that are susceptible to sea level rise. Actually, 1,500 miles of sea level, but about 93, or 1,500 miles of coastline, but about 93 to 94% of that is susceptible to sea level rise in the next five, 10 to 30 years. Uh, the Cape will still be there. It will just be more possible where you come across a day where, this, where it's sunny outside and there's no winter storm, there's no nor'easter, but you still have that potential for sunny day flooding from the tide cycle, but also from thermal expansion. As heat or as water holds more heat capacity, the size of it grows as well. 
the size of that water, the molecules themselves will grow. Not extreme, but it only takes a little bit to start to cause to tip the higher end of the scale, which I believe it was, yeah, last week when we had a winter storm, the dud of a winter storm that brought 0.1 inches of snowfall to Boston, uh, nine, in, nine inches on Martha's Vineyard, and uh, I think it was like eight to nine inches uh, for Sandwich, Massachusetts. Even then, we still saw the seaport of Boston flood, and some of that was because of the tide cycle, but also the wind direction too. And if we're adding more water to the equation, it's inevitable and it's impossible to just stop the water. Again, you can't just build a fence and say, all right, that's it, the water's done. No, it's still gonna splash over. And we saw that, we, I mean, you see it every day, every week, essentially on Morrissey Boulevard in Boston. Uh, this is what I'm most passionate about because I am an asthmatic. I forgot to take my inhaler before I left the house this morning, for, so forgive me if I'm sounding a wee bit hoarse. Um, asthma can be worsened by essentially, well, from birth, for me, it's pretty bad, but it can be worsened by air pollution. Um, living near power plants, cars, and trucks, where a lot of us live, a lot of us don't live, depending on your financial situation sometimes, or where you grew up, those are triggers that in the atmosphere, if we're adding more pollution, if we're adding more greenhouse gases, that will make the cases of asthmatics far worse. In the future of climate change, with uh, two to four degrees Celsius of warming, new asthma cases are expected to increase between four and 11% annually. Uh, that would be an increase of about 34,000 to 89,000 new diagnoses per year. Uh, and that's according to a report from the EPA, directly lifted from the EPA's report in 2023. I don't make these numbers up. Uh, also something that I'm more, um, I would say, sensitive to, as I worked for the Weather Channel, as I was able to go out throughout the country and see different spots of the world at their worst, or see different spots of the United States at their worst, be it because of a tornado or severe flooding or winter storms or hurricanes or all of those at once sometimes. And this is one of the ways that it's becoming more popular to quantify a disaster, either by deaths or by finances. I don't know who decided that's how we're gonna quantify disasters, but it seems like when it comes to people's dying, people dying or people's pocketbooks, that's when folks care the most. So uh, I wanna look at, I mean, we talked about the excessive deaths in heat waves in Chicago. I quickly wanna look at the finances here from our, or the US's billion dollar disaster since 1980. And this would all be adjusted, by the way. In 1980, it was far less frequent, and the disasters were on the order of, uh, let's see, maybe five to 10 since 1980. But then we get to 2023, and 2023 was a record-breaking year for billion-dollar disasters at 26 or 27 disasters for 2023 alone. Uh, 2024 is already in progress with a couple, of, a few, but I think the biggest way that we can look at this is severe storms. Again, when you feed more moisture into the atmosphere, you're giving the potential for higher end severe thunderstorms to contain tornadoes. That's a disaster. To contain uh, flooding. If you lived in Vermont in, 2020, in November, uh, September of 2023, uh, severe flooding there. All of these things are what adds up to become a billion dollar disaster. Scariest number, and I hate showing this, but I'm gonna show it because this is how we get our people prepared when we leave outside of this room. The days between billion dollar disaster events on average have dropped to 18. 18 days before the next disaster. Be it the atmospheric river events in California, perhaps more severe storms that we know are coming in March and April because those are traditionally the months that we look for severe thunderstorms across the South. Again, this is for the US, so it's not 18 days from now until mid-March in the Commonwealth, but the, uh, the uh, US as a whole only averages 18 days. How much time does it take our healthcare system, Gail, to bounce back after a disaster? A long time. More than 18 days? Yes. More than 18 days. How much, for all of you that own a home, how long does it take you to bounce back from a financial pitfall after a disaster? It takes insurance more than 18 days, I can tell you that. <laughs> 18 days is not that long to prepare for the next event, which is why we, I as a meteorologist am telling you that you have to press your community leaders, you have to ask what can we do to be prepared not only for the current one, but for the next few that are likely to come. 
And this gets back to preparation. All populations are vulnerable, but some are more vulnerable than others. Who's read Animal Farm before? All are created equal, but some are more equal than others, I think is that, that line. Can someone tell me uh, what is wrong with this picture? Wheelchair can't get off the curbing. What else? Someone else is going to say something. The guy has no feet. The guy has no feet. I think that was from a, just a bad copy and paste job. The guy has no feet. What else? He's not helping. He's not helping. Very good. What else? They're walking against the sign. They're walking against the sign. Okay. There's no help for the gentleman in the back. Uh, with the, what's that? I don't know, is he blind? I think so. He might be, right? He can't see that well. He can't see that well. Maybe he can't hear that well, too. So now, what improvements have we made? We lowered the sidewalk, we gave it a ramp so the uh, person in the wheelchair could go through. Uh, the gentleman that was leading the, uh, leading the charge out front is now behind the girl, so then that way uh, she can be visibly seen by cars that may be coming through uh, uh, between the streets too. And what was the, what, what's one of the most, the, the biggest thing that we added here, I think? The sound. the sound, the sound, right, exactly. So that's the difference in equity and equal rights. We made it so that everyone could use the same thing but we gave them what they needed to get there. And climate is the same way. If we want to prepare someone for the next natural disaster in 18 days, we can't give everyone the same thing. We have to give them what they need. And in order to give them what they need, we have to talk to them. We have to go to them and we have to find them where they are. This is a survey that was done uh, by the city of Boston who documents heat waves very well, I must say. Um, and they went to formerly red line neighborhoods, and that was a practice that was done in the 40s, 50s, and 60s uh, that prevented people of color specifically from getting mortgages and living in what, what was considered a more desirable neighborhood versus a less desirable neighborhood. None of that is any of your faults in here. I just want to make that known. Uh, but it, it is also applicable to what we see today in some of our worst neighborhoods today, in some of our hottest neighborhoods today, and also in some of our least climate resilient neighborhoods today too. Uh, in Boston, some of those formerly red line neighborhoods are about seven and a half degrees hotter during the day uh, and three and a half degrees warmer at night. What happens at night? That's when we're supposed to cool down. That's actually when our bodies relax, when we're in bed asleep. Well, we talked earlier about the lack of air conditioning in Boston or anywhere in the Commonwealth or New England for that matter, because that's our, how our homes were built to have AC. So what do you do in a neighborhood with no AC that's hotter than the rest of the town where the person perhaps is walking to work during the hottest times of day? Your body, again, is taking beating after beating after beating, and it's a silent killer. I don't know why we don't view heat as a very real disaster in this country, but it is. Urban heat islands contain about 20% less land for parks in Boston, and they have about 40% less tree canopy in those Boston neighborhoods. And I say in Boston specifically because that's a major metropolitan that has millions of people, whereas if you're here in Westford, I think you guys are uh, well on your way to not only having tree canopy, but also having several parks as well. And I think that is what is needed to help some neighborhoods, not all, be more climate resilient. If you're able to have tree canopy, you then have a lower heat. Uh, capacity because the heat is being protected from that tree canopy. You also probably have a better quality of life too in parks because kids are able to go and play when it is not unbearably hot. They're able to be more physically active on less polluted days. Um, let's see, and less resources to prepare and recover from climate disasters. That gets back to um, how people of color specifically have been traditionally um, left away from the climate conversation, but they're also less likely to be a reason for climate change. Uh, socioeconomic status. 
This is, uh, I think a lot of people forget that having money means that you can do more things or you get the privilege of doing more things that some folks can't. Um, climate related deaths, uh, climate related health risks are often greater for poor neighborhoods and poor individuals within any population. Here in the United States, we had a large disaster in 2005, that was Hurricane Katrina. That hit a, lo a lot of poor neighborhoods harder than, than those that were able to, uh, let's see, take PTO away from work to get out of way from Hurricane Katrina that was coming in, or they had the finances to buy a hotel, or they had the finances to have a car. All of these things allow you to flee a climate-related disaster before the disaster even strikes. So you're getting out of the way. Uh, but also we've seen in Europe that heat waves can happen and kill people um, on a greater extent for richer communities as well. This was in 2003. So it's not only happening in poor neighborhoods, it's just the impacts are seen differently in poor neighborhoods versus uh, richer communities. Expectant mothers, this is what I wanted to talk with all of you about. Um, I'm not a mom, I will never be a mom, thank God. But thank God for all the moms out there because we know that you are the backbone of every family. We also know that you are carrying children uh, on this earth every single day, not all of you every single day, but from expectant mothers as a whole. Black mothers specifically, for every 10 degree increase in temperature, this was in the state of California, there's an average increase in preterm delivery of 8.6%, but for black women that number is almost 15%. So nearly double where we see the rate of preterm delivery uh, for black women who live in some of the hottest communities of California. Uh, higher temperatures mean that every one degree Celsius in a week before delivery, there's a 6% greater likelihood that stillbirth occurs between May and the months of September. So our warmest months of the year are where moms are more likely to have or run the risk of stillbirth. Comes as no surprise to anyone, but I think putting these numbers in your face, you're able to quantify a disaster before it happens. Air pollution is also one thing that um, can impact every mom. Uh, specifically moms that are, that are in their final trimester, uh, where that increases the risk of stillbirth by 42%. Uh, air pollution and plants. For every, oh, not plants as in green plants, but plants as in polluted plants that run on waste. Uh, for every three miles closer to a waste to energy plant, uh, the risk of low birth weight increases by 3%. So if you live within a mile, that would basically increase it by 6%. Uh, and that was looking at about 500 births in Florida from 2004 to 2005. Uh, so again, these case, case studies are done in different spots of the country, but I just caution you to say that we know that these are happening not just at borders, not just at fences, not just at our neighbor's house, but because of the way that the world works and the atmosphere works and we see different patterns migrate across the country. It's not something that is solely unique to a community in Florida or California. Intergenerational inequities. So we've talked about color, we've talked a race, we've talked about uh, gender. What about for the younger folks that are here today or even younger before you're able to really talk and formulate a sentence? Climate change is still a risk. In fact, I would argue that climate change is impacting kids more severely than it's impacting adults. A, because adults would not be here in 60, 70, 80 years, but these newborn babies will, these three-year-olds will, but they don't get a voice or a say when it comes to how they are gonna be dealt, dealing with climate change um, in the future. So we have to cater to that audience and we have to think about our climate action plans on a local, state, and federal level on integrating children into these plans before they're able to have a voice. We have to cater to them as a priority. Think about kids when they are born, they're crawling on the ground from zero to, I don't have kids, so I don't really know how they grow out of that. One year, two, when do they start to walk? Yeah, about, a year. about a year, all right, cool. So I was on, great, <laughs> doing good. Zero to one, they're crawling. And then one to two, they're growing even more and they're growing even more, but they're never really up here in height until 13, 14, 15, 16, they get away from the ground. Guess where a lot of our pollution is at? At the ground. Guess who breathes at a much higher rate than you and I? Children. So not only are they living in the air pollution, they're breathing it at a much more frequent rate. And they're breathing it at a frequent rate where their system, their lung capacity is not the same as you and I. So all of their organs are still growing and processing but we're subjecting them to more 
air pollution and more heat at a much different rate and in a much different way. The other thing that I was going to add to, to children too is that I think we've got to be very mindful of whatever situation we're allowing our kids to walk into in the future. And I say our kids, I don't have kids yet, but at some point I will. Um, and I want to hand them the best that I possibly can. And I think as a parent, that's what your desire is to have your kid have it better than you had it. Leave it better than you found it. We have to leave our earth better than we found it. And we're not doing a good job at that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, still looking at inter intergenerational inequities. Uh, childhood asthma rates are likely to increase uh, because of pollen. No surprise. You can't breathe. You're having an asthma attack. There's more pollen in the air. You're breathing in the pollen. You're breathing in the pollutants. Uh, that's likely to increase uh, ER visits from 17% to 30% because of pollen. Lyme disease, vector-borne illnesses. I am not an expert on vector-borne illnesses, but guess what? I am from the South, and I know what happens when mosquitoes don't die in December. Guess what? That is becoming more and more frequent across the country and across the world. Uh, but we may have to start thinking about that. I was actually, this morning when I was walking in, tangent, sort of aside, um, the birds were chirping. Granted, the sun is now out at seven in the morning, hallelujah, and it's only gonna get better from here. But guess what? Our nature is telling us that something's not right. It's not as cold as it used to be, so we're not killing off mosquitoes as early as we used to. They're living throughout the entire season. And guess what else? They love water. Guess who hates water? The atmosphere, because it, it just rains more and more and more. And so you, well, it doesn't hate water, but there's more water in the water cycle because of our global warming. For every degree Celsius, four to 7% more water vapor, standing water, mosquitoes, they're not dead, boom. I mean, it's not that simple, but for the sake of the argument, it will be that simple. Uh, this was important as well, an impact on school performance. And this was a story, uh, a part of a story that I did uh, last year in Boston where we looked at how public housing integrated more green friendly initiatives in their public buildings and they were able to add um, not only uh, um, respiratory filters inside of the facilities but they also sealed off air pollution that would have occurred outside. They kept it on the outside and it didn't come inside. Uh, so they were building a better quality of life while also building a better life for their, ten, uh, their tenants and residences. Uh, four to 7% decrease in academic achievement because if you're not breathing healthy air and you're going to the doctor or you, you're having an asthma attack, you can't be in the classroom. If you're not in the classroom, you're not getting the education that you need to become a better steward of society. There could essentially be a future president in the halls of any of these classrooms in Western Massachusetts, but we could be stopping that child from becoming their fullest potential or their fullest self because they're breathing in poor air quality. Uh, let's see here, air pollution accounts for about 20% of newborn deaths worldwide. That is uh, a global stat from the EPA, I believe. So it's not true to Massachusetts specifically, it's not true to the US specifically, but again, that does speak to the notion that air pollution is another concern when it comes to uh, warming in the atmosphere and greenhouse gases that are emitted into the atmosphere. Uh, but I do want to leave you with a bit of hope because I think we've talked a lot about doom and gloom and not about uh, enough about uh, satisfaction and successes that we've seen from a climate change perspective on the earth. And as a country, we're seeing more nations come together aiming for net zero carbon initiatives, which is fantastic. You're seeing more car companies also aim for that as well. So now it's becoming more mainstream where everyone is now asking the question, okay, we know that this is a thing, but what can I do about it? And that, I think that's what a lot of you came here today uh, for as well. So the conversations are becoming the norm um, and investors are acting more on climate change too. Uh, with that, I think that is the end of my presentation. That is the end of my presentation.